All right. And just to confirm, you can see promoting the use of nutritional supplements. Awesome. Perfect. OK, so when promoting, um, like I talked about, when promoting the use of nutritional supplements, it's really tailored to the patient and what these patients happen to be missing. So if our cancer patients, um, usually it's going to be common with our cancer patients, if they're missing certain vitamins, minerals, et cetera, they're going to be that population that specifically benefits from the use of supplements. The overarching kind of nursing consideration for nutritional supplements is that whenever we're doing medication reconciliation, we're asking our patients, what types of meds are you taking? Um, what are you taking at home, et cetera? We need to be asking them about their nutritional supplements because we never know if there might be any sort of um, contraindication or if these supplements might interact with a possible drug we might be giving them. So always remember to get a full history. And if a patient does let you know that they are taking a nutritional supplement, we really need to know how much, how frequent, what is it. And I included a couple examples of some of our most common nutritional supplements. Um, for iron deficiency anemia, this is going to be one of the most common nutritional disorders. Um, we'll review a little bit later our iron-dense foods, such as our red meats. Um, but usually these patients, it's a little bit more of an insidious onset. Um, but they're going to start having some fatigue, lethargy, pallor, headache tachycardia, etc. And this can affect your patients from all sorts of age ranges. Um, so just keep that in mind that when we are having pediatrics with iron deficiency anemia, we might not see the same symptoms because they're not able to tell us, mom, mom, I'm lethargic, mom, I feel wonky. Um, but you might notice that they're sitting alone at recess and they're not playing. So just kind of keep that um, in mind. So some foods high in iron, our number one um, consideration for iron deficiency anemia is we want to find the root of the problem. It's usually linked to diet. Um, so we want to be educating them on eating foods that are high in iron. Additionally, we can advocate that they do take a iron supplement. However, it's going to be a little bit more beneficial if we get to the root of the problem. And what's the root of the problem? Diet. So meat, fish, poultry, beans, whole grains for our patients that are vegetarian or vegan, some iron fortified foods, iron fortified cereals, etc. cetera. Um, pay special attention. Whenever we're taking uh, um, eating foods high in iron, we want to pair that with vitamin C. This is going to help increase the iron absorption. So some orange juice, tomatoes, et cetera, is gonna be very beneficial you know, teaching your patients the importance of a balanced meal. A balanced meal for iron deficiency anemia may look like um, lean red meats, um, like steak on top of a salad with um, maybe some tomatoes. That's really going to help them um, with increasing not only their iron intake, but the absorption of it as well. So we talked a little bit earlier about our cancer patients. They're going to be very at risk for malnutrition, but it can affect any patient, especially with more of our chronic disease processes. So um, if your patient, um, we want to really look at what their pre-albumin levels are because this, this is going to tell us how well their protein intake is and how um, much food that they're taking in. It's a good indicator for if my patient is nourished or not, if my dietary teaching is good enough. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, a lot of our clinical findings of malnutrition, you'll have that pitting edema, hair loss, they may feel emancipated, um, etc. So as nurses, if we kind of notice our patient is um, maybe an older adult, that's in an assisted living facility or an older adult living with a child, or maybe we are talking about a child, we may need to consult with social services to kind of figure out how we can make sure that these patients do um, get a lot. 
Um, I did get a question. Will ATI give the reference ranges? Do you know? Um, I know in the last ATI NCLEX exam, um, we took for nutrition, they did, didn't provide those. Um, but we also took it in, in complex health before they kind of switched the next gen. Um, if you're what I have seen, however, is if you're having one of those questions that involve like nursing notes, and I think they're more of the case study questions. Sometimes the case study questions will include those in the MAR, but it's not a guarantee that you're going to get that every time. Yeah, so if there's an NGN question, an NGN style question, it will include that. All right, so now we're going to specifically talk about our patients um, with cancer that might be going through um, treatment. So um, in our previous lecture, we talked a lot about safety and radiation, kind of using those metal tongs, et cetera. But what I really want you guys to know for nutrition is that these patients are going to hydrated. So we really do want to encourage um, a good intake of liquid throughout the day. We really want to also avoid foods high in roughage. So what is roughage? It's just stuff that's going to irritate the stomach, irritate the intestine. So kind of think of your health, your traditional health foods, your quinoas, your flax, all of that, that kind of help with feel we want to avoid those because diarrhea is really common with these patients and we really kind of want to put them more on that rat diet the bananas rice applesauce toast etc um just to kind of deal with the diarrhea and things uh, we do want to advocate that they increase intake of pectin this is really going to help with that diarrhea as well it's going to kind of help bulk the stool therefore when you have bulk the stool it's going to move as quickly and kind of come out as money as always, if we're having upset stuff, and caffeine um, and fatty is really important. These patients, we also want to limit hot or cold drinks. And the reason we do that is because the lesions on the lips, the mouth, et cetera, are really um, prevalent. In um, So what, as nurses, are we going to do? Well, a lot of the reason in which these patients are malnourished is because they have an awful taste or they might have lesions on the mouth. And overall, food is not enjoyable to them anymore. Um, especially if we get that radiation on the neck, they're going to have just huge um, alterations in taste. So what can we do as nurses? So as nurses, what can we kind of do to help out with this? Well, we're going to provide a lot of education on maybe eating some tart foods. That way they can actually taste the food. Um, encouraging small frequent meals, that's going to help overall increase the calorie consumption. Um, just because it's going to be a little bit easier for them to kind of sit, pick a little bit, take a break, go back and graze, et cetera. So we really want to also add sauces and seasonings um, and using plastic utensils. If they have a metallic taste in their mouth, giving them food on a metal spoon or a metal fork is probably not going to be very beneficial for this population. Um, they can also suck on some mints, candies, et cetera. Um, meat is really important in getting in our protein, but if they just don't have an appetite for meat, well, maybe we can put some cranberry sauce on turkey, or if we're having a turkey sandwich, we can put some apple slices on it. Those are really good ways to help kind of allow these patients to taste a little bit better. So some nutritional concepts for our cardiovascular health. Um, are very important in managing almost all sorts of heart disease. A lot of the root of the problem is lifestyle. Um, what in, what's included in lifestyle, activity, and nutrition. So um, for our patients that have hypertension, we want to put them on what's called the DASH diet. Um, however, we do want to kind of taper towards the patient because if all of a sudden we tell them you can only have 1,500 milligrams they're probably not going to be able to do that. It's going to be a lot for them. So we're going to kind of have them taper it down. 
so we're gonna our starting point is about 2300 milligrams but we really do want to wean it down to about 1500 milligrams so how do we do this we want to decrease foods high in sodium anything that comes out of your pantry um, is going to be very high in sodium um, we also want to choose low fat dairy products because these are going to be a lot lower in sodium as well obviously increasing fruits and vegetables are very beneficial and really just making sure your patient knows how to read their food labels, whether it be on the back of a cereal box or actually on the nutritional menu in restaurants, just so that they can kind of track how much sodium that they are taking in. When cooking, it is recommended that we use liquid oils instead of oils that contain saturated fat. So with our saturated fat, that's going to be our butter. They're solids at room temperature. So really, instead of using butter, we want to use some canola oil. That's going to be the best form of fat. When you're caring for patients that are taking gly cardiac glycosides or diuretics, we do have a couple things we need to think about. If my patient is on a diuretic, and let's go back to the function of diuretics. They're gonna help you excrete a lot of things. So if my patient is on a traditional diuretic, um, let's say a thiazide diuretic, they're gonna be excreting a lot of potassium. They're gonna be at risk for hypokalemia. So we wanna educate them on increasing their foods in potassium. So what are some high potassium foods? Apricots, bananas, some beans. Um, lentils, very good. Um, so that's just kind of what we're going to do for patients that are on diuretics. However, if your patient is on a potassium sparing diuretic, such as spironolactone, this does not get rid of potassium. So in this case, we'd want to advocate for low potassium foods. So if you're ever caring for a patient that's taking a statin, these drugs help lower cholesterol. However, they're not a cure drug. You need to make sure you're also changing your diet as well. So um, with these medications, it's important to know that you have to take your medications with an evening meal. And what are your meals gonna look like? A low cholesterol meal. So some whole grains, fruits, berries, beans, all very, very helpful. Now let's talk about GI disorders. Um, so when a patient's having dysphagia, they're having some difficulties with swallowing. Um, so what do we do for these patients? We're gonna put them on a safe diet. Usually in the hospital, they'll be on what's called a thickened liquid diet. And you actually end up pouring these little packets of a honey-like consistency into any beverage. And this is going to help them um, add bulk and thickness to their liquids that way because it's heavier with gravity it actually is going to go down the pipe if you will a little bit quicker um so like everything there's kind of a spectrum with um really what we're doing with these patients so the patients level one they're on pureed foods so in a hospital it's going to be anything that kind of went through a blender and then you can kind of see these progressions as well um, with your mechanically altered or your advanced. Talked about celiac disease before. Just to recap, these patients cannot have gluten. So we're going to make sure we give them a gluten-free diet and they do need to follow this for life. Um, so any sort of rye, uh, wheat, anything like that is really bad for them. So Really promoting fresh fruits, fetch best of fresh vegetables, meats, etc., is going to be very helpful. Um, so dumping syndrome, we <laughs> talked about this one too. Um, but with these, really the overall goal, how do we prevent dumping syndrome? Slow it down. Small, frequent meals. We want to make sure that really food has time to go through the digestive system. So really, how, what can we do? We're gonna consume small frequent meals, maybe lie down after meals. Um, 
a big, you know, thing that these patients want to avoid is high sugar, high fat foods. Um, so just kind of review some of the interventions and what signs and symptoms we're going to monitor for dumping syndrome. Um, gastric bypass surgery, essentially, is just taking out a part of the stomach and making it a lot smaller. Um, so these patients, they might have been able to consume a large quantity of food, but after gastric bypass surgery, they can only consume a pretty small quantity of food, and this is what's going to help them lose weight. Um, with these patients, though, because they can only take in such a small amount of food, we want to make sure that whatever they're eating is nutrient dense and that and that they're not wasting their space on chips or candy or anything like that. We want to make sure we're not getting any sort of micronutrient deficiencies or even macronutrient deficiencies. So just kind of um, review a couple of those concepts. Um, increasing fiber is really important in patients that might suffer from constipation or in GI diseases. Um, but again, fiber helps bulk up the stool. So um, some foods that are high in fiber, your whole grains, brown rice, oats, vegetables, broccoli, beans, flaxseed. If your patient is experiencing diarrhea, we're not going to want to give them a lot of fiber. Um, we're going to want to give them a low fiber diet, more your brat diet, to just kind of stop the production of stool because really we don't want that when your patient's already having frequent bowel movement. Um, so we're just going to review a little bit on some nutritional concepts for diabetes. Um, there are certain populations that are a bit more risk for diabetes, so just keep that in mind. Um, many sort of links, including cultural foods, events, barriers to nutrition, um, kind of all contribute to put certain populations um, more at risk for diabetes. Um, if you've ever heard of your hot, dry sugar high, that's what hyperglycemia symptoms are. So if my patient, keep in mind, uh, any patient can have hyperglycemia, whether it's a diabetic patient or maybe a kid that just ingested way too much candy really, really fast. So you're going to see an elevated blood glucose reading. And while there's a variety of other symptoms, specifically pay attention to your hot, dry, sugar high. They're going to be very thirsty. Um, with our diabetic patients and undergoing diabetic ketoacidosis, this is when we actually do see ketones in the urine and some small respiration. So just do keep that in mind. But that is severe hyperglycemia. Um, so whenever we're teaching our diabetic population, we're teaching them to avoid high glycemic index foods. That is a big fancy word for foods with a lot of sugar. So, um, or foods that are going to raise your blood sugar pretty high. Um, so just know that really our baked potatoes and our pastas have the highest glycemic index. I included a photo for you guys to just kind of see it categorizes all the different food groups and kind of shows you what some high glycemic index food may be and, and what are maybe some, some lower options for these patients. But really, potatoes and pasta, not a good thing. Some special dietary considerations. Um, as nurses, we're going to be dealing with a lot of different patients with lots of different backgrounds. So we really want to make sure that we perform a cultural assessment about fasting. So what is fasting? This is when a patient will either not eat during a certain time period or maybe they only eat certain things during a time period. As nurses, we are expected to know a little bit about some of the more common um, fasting times. However, not every patient we care for will fast. So you might be caring for a patient that is Catholic, but they just might choose not to fast and that's totally okay. So we always need to perform a cultural assessment about fasting and always ask your patient. Um, if your patient does let you know, hey, I'm going to be fasting for 24 hours, maybe we can work with dietary 
or food service to get them maybe two or three meals, two or three extra meals the day before. So just always kind of keep in mind as a nurse, how would I best respect my patient's wishes and always know that we never assume we always do have to ask. So phosphate binders. Um, this is another concept um, in nutrition, but if your patient is ever on a phosphate binder, usually our dialysis patients um, or patients with renal failure will be um, prescribed phosphate binders. But the important thing with these drugs is that they're going to help reduce phosphate production, but in order to do that, we have to take these drugs with meals. Um, so just remember that. And how do we determine effectiveness? Well, we're going to get a serum phosphorus level. We just want to see a nice trend downward um, just to make sure that all this phosphorus isn't building up in these patients. And again, um, just maybe avoiding some milk products, chocolate, nuts, etc. Um, so our lacto-vegetarian diet is your... When you think of your traditional vegetarian diet, this is what it's going to be. So if you ever see lacto, lacto think milk. So vegetarian, that's referring to the absence of meat. So a lacto vegetarian diet, this is going to be a diet that doesn't include um, meats and eggs, but it does include dairy products. So just keep that in mind. Um, going back, um, our vegan diet, however, will not include any sort of dairy products, just to kind of reinforce that topic. So now we're going to talk about some fluid and electrolyte imbalances. So um, if my patient's experiencing a fluid volume deficit, um, there's a couple different things that we can do to kind of determine what's going on. Um, so usually these patients are pretty dehydrated, so you're going to kind of see that tachycardia, hypotension, um, thready pulse. The reason they do have the tachycardia is they're trying to combat for that hypotension. Um, they also are going to be pretty tachypnic. Um, think about if you've ever seen someone that's dehydrated, they're pretty dizzy, possibility of fainting, confusion, weakness, fatigue, etc. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. When we talk about some GI symptoms, well, if we're dehydrated, my body's going to do whatever it can to get us some water. So it's going to increase our thirst, um, etc. So just keep that in mind. Um, other signs and symptoms are going to have kind of cool, clammy skin. They might be a little bit sweaty, um, sunken eyeballs, etc. On the flip side, if we suspect our patient's having an episode of water intoxication or they're in fluid overload, um, this is when we're going to see that bounding blood pressure, that really high blood pressure. It's going to put a lot of stress on all the organs of the body, specifically our lungs. Um, so pay attention. They might have difficulties breathing. That's a really big one for these patients. Um, so yeah. Um, when we're talking about maternal health, we are talking about... Um, either moms that are pregnant or maybe they're breastfeeding, et cetera. So if we have a patient that's breastfeeding, um, our breastfeeding moms do need to still increase our calorie intake. Um, for about the first really six months, um, we're going to increase that intake and even up to the second six months. So just really think for about a year, their calorie intake is going to be 300 to 400 extra calories a day. This is because um, those are the amount needed to really effectively produce and replenish breast milk. Um, if we're providing education to our moms, how can we help them through this process? So really, we want to wake up the baby about every four hours during the day or sorry, every three hours during the day and about every four hours at night, just to kind of get them on a little bit more of a routine schedule. I know it seems a little bit silly to kind of wake them up this often, but it's going to avoid them waking you up because they're super, super hungry. Also, they're kind of in that feeding and growing stage, so just keep that in mind. 
Um, if your mom is breastfeeding, let her know that she can store her bottles um, as long as she labels them and she can just pop them in the refrigerator. However, um, once we, if we ever want to freeze breast milk, we can do that to make it stay a little bit longer. Um, but when we're doing that, just know that you never want to put breast milk in the microwave. Um, we always want to make sure we thaw it in the refrigerator. So if a mom freeze her breast milk, <clears throat> or maybe she got breast milk from a donor that was frozen, before she uses it, she does need to thaw it in the refrigerator. Once it is thawed, it can be stored for about 24 hours. Um, when we're talking about weight gain, in order to support the baby, we do need to increase our calorie consumption, especially during our third trimester. Um, however, kind of calories can fluctuate every day, especially if you're not tracking them. Um, so what we can do as nurses is just say maybe add some protein. If you're eating a salad, add some extra chicken, etc. Um, but really, a good predictor of making sure our mom is nourished is kind of looking at that weight gain. So if my mom, before um, becoming pregnant, has a normal BMI, we want her to gain about a pound a week. Um, but just remember, a total of 25 to 35 pounds. If my mom happened to be underweight, that's when we're going to want her to gain around 30 to 40 pounds. If my mom was overweight, we still do want her to gain some weight, but just not as much because that can put a little bit extra stress on the pregnancy. So maybe gaining about 15 to 25 pounds. If your mom is obese, we do want to, again, these moms still do need to gain weight with these babies to make sure that they're growing. Um, but with these patients, we might want them to gain about 11 to 20 pounds during pregnancy. Um, a really big concept is folate in pregnancy. This is going to help prevent birth defects, but specifically our neural tube defects. So a lot of our prenatal vitamins are high in folate, um, but just really know um, increasing that folate, folic acid, is gonna be really important in preventing some birth defects. Um, they can get this from a multivitamin, but they can also just increase it in their diet. So our leafy green vegetables, really, really helpful. Nuts, seeds, more of our tropical fruits, our mangoes, papayas, citrus fruits are really, really important. Um, so if your patient is not taking prenatal vitamins, um, really advocate how we can increase that in our diet. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever um, in your mom baby rotations, if you've ever cared for a infant with a cleft lip, but these patients might have a little bit of a harder time with feeding. Um, and really the issue is making that seal around the bottle. Um, so what can we do? We're going to really help kind of squeeze their little cheeks together, and this is going to help them form that seal. However, these patients, or sorry, these kids might, you know, have a little bit of difficulties feeding. So if you notice your patient or your baby is showing some signs of distress, we're going to want to remove the nipple of the bottle. Um, during their feed, we do want to burp them two to three times. So just kind of remember that. But really, just remember these these little babies, they just can't seal their little mouths around the bottle. So we got to help them out a little bit with that. Um, for our toddlers, on the other hand, there are picky eaters. Um, so they might not want to try everything, but we do want to slowly introduce different foods into their diet. Our main concern, though, is going to be choking. So we really want to make sure that we're cutting our grapes in half, maybe in a few quarter pieces. Um, if we have little cubes of cheese, that we're cutting them really, really small, just so that they can swallow them and there's a very low risk for choking. These kids do prefer finger foods. They like to kind of touch things, explore. They're still in that learning development phase. So just keep that in mind. Um, I included some good examples of foods that typically do well with these little ones. Um, 
but really supervise them during meals. Make sure their meals are safe. You're not handing a toddler a big, thick, sticky peanut butter and jelly sandwich because um, they're really small and choking is a really big concern. So now we're going to talk about some concepts of weight reduction. So overall, weight reduction is very good on um, the patient's overall health. By maintaining a nice, healthy weight, um, we have decreased risks of all sorts of different pathologies, specifically our heart health. It's really important. So our patients that maintain a normal BMI or maybe patients that had lost weight if they were overweight or obese, um, their life expectancy actually does increase. So just kind of keep that in mind. As nurses out in the population with public health, we do want to focus on diet and exercise and efforts to reduce weight. A big thing um, to aid in weight reduction is reducing our fat intake. So we want about 20 to 35% of our total daily calories to come from fat. So if we kind of break it down with the math, we want them eating about 44 to 77 grams of fat. So again, really opting for just more of our nutrient dense foods such as broccoli, Brussels sprouts, et cetera, those are really low in fat. But maybe if they do want some milk or they do want some cheese, we opt for low fat dairy products. So just keep that in mind. Any of our fried foods are also very high in fat. So a good thing we can do is um, if my patient likes chicken, maybe chicken nuggets aren't the best idea. Um, but maybe if we have skinless chicken, that can really, really benefit them. Um, ideally, we want our patients to have a low saturated fat diet as well. When we talk about our saturated fats, think solids at room temperature. So when you see that S with low saturated, think solids. Um, some other things we can do to kind of limit that saturated fat is to really, if you see fat on your meats, like your steaks, to just kind of cut that off or trim it. Um, usually more of our leaner meats, such as turkey and chicken, have a lot less fat. Um, really just avoid the fryer pretty much at all costs. Um, and again, like I mentioned, using low-fat milk, low-fat dairy, et cetera, is really beneficial. Um, also, instead of using butter or salt to season our food, maybe we can use some fresh herbs and spices. So how many fat calories should we be eating per day? Well, again, go back to our little bit of nutrition conversion. If we if our expected amount of fat per day is to be about 20 to 35 percent of our calories we multiply that by how many calories we're supposed to be eating and that's going to tell us how much it's going to come from fat so i provided a little bit of an example but i do just want to kind of review that basic kind of nutrition concepts of fats being nine calories carbs four protein four etc just kind of keep that keep that in mind when we talk about complete protein, this is our protein that consists of all nine of the essential amino acids. Um, not important to know what the exact amino acids are, um, but just know that we want to advocate for complete protein to make sure that they're getting all the um, healthy proportions needed. Um, our single source proteins, those are um, anything that is more of our animal-based products. Um, just keep in mind that if our patient is vegetarian or if they're vegan and they're eating a lot of plant products, while they might be intaking protein, it's going to be more of that incomplete protein. It's not going to contain all nine of the essential amino acids. So just um, keep that in mind as well. A really good way to get in our complete protein is going to be through our animal products. So um, we are going to go ahead and jump into our Kahoot. Alrighty, we're going to go ahead and get started.
Awesome job, guys. So remember, if our patient is in stage five kidney failure, we are limiting everything, specifically our sodium and our potassium. Um, so all the other food choices were pretty high in salt. So the best choice is gonna be some cream of wheat, blueberries, and some coffee. Very good. This one is a select all that apply. A nurse is caring for a group of patients. What disorders should the nurse identify as increasing the patient's metabolic needs? Select all that apply. All right, so our cancer patients, COPD patients, and our Parkinson's patients, these patients will all have an increased metabolic need. All this means is that these patients require more calories and more nutrients. Hypothyroidism, when our patient has hypothyroidism, they all actually have a lessened metabolism. So other disease processes that would increase our metabolic needs would be burns. Our burn patients um, just require a lot more calories to heal. A nurse is providing dietary a nurse providing dietary teaching should focus on foods high in what vitamin that might be lacking in a vegan diet. A little hint, these are all foods that are high in the nutrient they are lacking. They're good vegan options. Good job, guys. So these patients are specifically deficient in B12. A lot of our fruits, vegetables, etc., are high in all of the other vitamins, A, C, and E, but not very high in B12. B12 comes from a lot of our animal products. The nurse recognizes that the majority of patients' caloric needs should come from what source? Good job, guys. So our carbs are going to give us the most energy. They are the most, they have the highest amount of nutrients. Um, so carbs, uh, the majority of our diet should come from carbs. About 40% of our diet comes from carbs. And then the rest gets divvied, divvied up into proteins and fats. Carbs are the preferred source of energy for our bodies. When the nurse identifies a patient at risk for malnutrition with nutritional screening, what is the next best step for the nurse? What do we always do first, guys? Awesome job. We assess first. We have to figure out what's going on. My patient seems to be at risk for malnutrition. What's going on? Maybe they're just having a difficult time going to the grocery store. We have to figure out what the problem is first. All the others are good options, but the thing we do first, perform that assessment. Very good. In providing diet education for a patient on a low-fat diet, it is important for the nurse to understand that. Awesome. So our saturated fats are found mostly in animal sources. So this question was asking a lot about saturated versus unsaturated fats. 
So our unsaturated fats, those are more of our better fats, if you will. So almonds, pecans, legumes, all of those are really high in that unsaturated, sorry, they're high in unsaturated fat, so they're low in that saturated fat. Our Western diet is very, very high in saturated fat. Um, remember, saturated, think solids, butter, salt, um, so just keep that in mind. After ordering formula for your TPN patient, total parental nutrition, pharmacy tells you that they are all out. What do we do? So, if my patient is out of their TPN formula, I should give them dextrose in 10% water. So, our TPN is tailored to the patient. Um, usually in the morning, we get labs on our patients. We get an electrolyte panel. We send that over to pharmacy, and pharmacy gives us our TPN. Um, and it's actually customized to that patient and their needs. Um, TPN is not the same as our formula feeds. TPN also will go through a central line. But if at any point we are out of TPN, this is a medical emergency because they are missing out on the electrolytes that they need. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to give them dextrose and water to kind of hold them over a little bit. It's really important. Which of the following laboratory findings indicates a client has reached one of the goals of the DASH diet? We're talking about a goal of the DASH diet. Awesome. And this where um, this is where help, sorry, this is where knowing our normal lab values is very helpful. Ideally, we want our total cholesterol to be less than 200. Um, so if my total cholesterol is 190, that means I'm doing a pretty good, good job. A nurse is caring for a patient undergoing neck radiation. The nurse should monitor wh for which potential adverse effect. So we're talking about an adverse effect, not a side effect. All right. So let's talk about it. So if we go back to pharmacology, it's important to understand the differences between an adverse and effect and a side effect. Side effects are usually common and they're not really life-threatening. Our adverse effects are a little bit more rare, but they can warrant emergencies. So decreased appetite and lethargy are all side effects of radiation. Same with hoarseness of breath. <coughs> Temperature is just unrelated. But radiation can actually cause changes in the production of saliva. So what are these patients at risk for? They're at risk for aspiration. When we go back to our ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, if we have aspiration, that's a pretty big problem. A nurse is caring for a patient with mucositis following chemotherapy. What pieces of education should the nurse provide?
Awesome. So, um, with mucositis, this is our kind of oral lesions um, in the mouth. A really good um, thing for these patients to do is to increase our fluid intake to help with that mucositis. Um, we won't all, mucositis won't always warrant an antibiotic either. Um, when you see situs, all that's telling us is their inflammation. Usually, though, um, with chemotherapy patients, we wouldn't give an antibiotic because what's the course, cause of the mucositis? It's the chemo treatment. So just kind of keep that in mind. But the best thing for patients with mucositis is to increase that fluid intake. A nurse is providing nutrition teaching to a Korean patient. The nurse must understand that the focus of the teaching should be Awesome job, guys. We, although my patient's Korean, we never want to assume that they might follow um, those traditional Korean meals, preferences, etc. So we always assess our patient. What meals do you like? What do you participate in? <laughs> oh no, Ray. <laughs> In teaching mothers-to-be about infant nutrition, the nurse instructs patients to Awesome. We want to um, remind these moms that breast milk or formula is sufficient for the first four to six months, meaning babies can only have breast milk or formula for the first four to six months of their life. Then we can start introducing maybe some cereal puffs um, when they get to around one year, introducing those allergen foods. But until our baby's about four months old, they should really only ever have formula or breast milk. Not even water. These babies can't even have water. In providing prenatal care to a patient, the nurse teaches the expectant mother that Awesome job, guys. Folic acid is very, very important. An elderly patient has been diagnosed with imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirements. Treatment regimen should include... All right. Um, so with these patients, we want to encourage our fiber intake. I know blue looked a little bit tricky, um, but we still want to make sure our patients are drinking fluids. Um, I see why you guys chose this one. Had the question stated, Deke, um, limit fluid intake with meals, that would be correct. So a good way to, you know, kind of encourage meals would be to kind of having the meal on its own. But overall, we don't want to decrease our fluid intake, maybe just with meals. Um, so really, the most correct answer is going to be encouraging fiber intake, especially because this population's GI tract um, is not as effective. Fiber is very important for our older adults.
And again, uh, with weight gain, we want to see a nice steady trend. We don't want them to gain a bunch of weight at once because um, that might be difficult. After teaching a patient about loop diuretics, which statement indicates the teaching was not effective? All right, so um, the correct answer is green. Remember, our loop diuretics, um, those are our um, potassium sparing diuretics. So if my patient is on loop diuretics, they should not increase their intake of potassium because their potassium will build up because they're not excreting it. Um, all the other options were actually effective. Um, so just kind of go back and review your medications. What are my loop diuretics? I promise you, your loop diuretics will not go away. They are in all of Complex Health 2. They are all over the NCLEX. Um, so just kind of keep in mind that. Select all that apply. What electrolyte imbalances would the nurse monitor for in the patient who is taking a loop diuretic? All right, so the answer for this one is going to be uh, hyponatremia, hypomagnesia. Um, you're also going to watch for hypokalemia. Um, typically, our diuretics don't interfere too much with calcium. Mainly, we're looking at sodium, potassium, magnesium. A nurse is providing education on foods that increase iron absorption. Which of the following food choices is best? Awesome. So remember, vitamin C aids in the absorption of iron. What's high in vitamin C? Oranges. A nurse is providing education to a patient taking warfarin. What food choices should the patient avoid? So think about what warfarin is and what it does. Awesome, guys. So warfarin um, prevents blood clots. What's the antidote for warfarin? The antidote for warfarin is vitamin K. What foods are really high in vitamin K? Green leafy vegetables. So if my patient is on the anticoagulant warfarin, I don't want them in taking a lot of vitamin K. This will help you on your farm final as well. Which of the following diseases is associated with a vitamin C deficiency? Scurvy. It's going to be scurvy. Scurvy is associated with a vitamin C deficiency. Select all that apply. 
Which of the following clinical findings are suggestive of malnutrition? Awesome job, guys. You did very, very well. A nurse is assisting a patient with choosing food. Which of the following actions by the nurse demonstrates ethnocentricity? Awesome. Um, so ethnocentricity, I think me, that is all about me, 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 me. So if I'm demonstrating ethnocentricity, I'm telling them what I like. Oops. So um, I accidentally clicked green, but the correct answer is blue. That would be demonstrating ethnocentricity. I think I read the question really wrong. Sorry. That's okay. I apologize to you. Um, the answer choice should be blue, um, but also with cahoots, I'm limited to how much characters I have in the in the question, so sometimes I have to mess around with it. But when we think ethnocentricity, that's like all about me. So that would that would be me telling my patient, well, I like chicken, so you should order chicken. Instead of saying, well, wh what do you like? Another select all that apply. A nurse ad is administering bolus enteral feedings to a patient. What interventions are appropriate? Awesome job, guys. So before doing a bolus feeding, we want to make sure we hear bowel sounds. We want to flush the tubing. Um, additionally, we would elevate the head of the bed to at least 30 degrees. Also, we never want to warm or cool the formula. We want it at room temperature. Another select all that apply. A nurse is caring for a patient with dephagia. What interventions help decrease the risk of aspiration during feeds? Good job, guys. Um, we wouldn't want to give them liquids at the end of the meals because remember these patients need thickened liquids because they can actually choke on regular liquids. A nurse is teaching a client about dietary recommendations to lower blood pressure. What statement indicates an understanding? Awesome, guys. Remember, our low-fat dairy products are a lot less um, heavy in sodium and fats. Good job. A type 2 diabetic patient states, 
I eat pasta every day. I can't imagine giving it up. What response should the nurse provide? Awesome. So this kind of piggybacks on our empathetic communication. So remember, with diabetes, we want to lower sugar. Remember, our pasta is pretty high in sugar because it's high in carbs. So we don't want to tell these patients you can never eat pasta again. That's one, not very kind. It's not very compassionate. And it's also not really feasible. So these patients can can have pasta still, they just might need to have a little bit less. But they are going to need to limit it to an extent. You are providing dietary teaching for a patient with AIDS who has stomatitis of the mouth. What education should you provide? All right. So remember, with stomatitis, just think sores and lesions on the mouth. So popsicles will help with the numbing. Um, usually for stomatitis, these patients might benefit from straws. That way, if maybe they have like a cold sore or a lesion on the front of their mouth, it's not being irritated by some warmed beverages or super cold beverages for that instance. But like a popsicle is going to help with that pain. Which statement made by a patient of a two-month-old infant requires further teaching? I apologize. <laughs> um, so, um, I just messed up this question. Um, the answer was supposed to be, I will feed my baby cow milk. Um, but we can actually start introducing some small cereals to them starting at four months. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about this question. Another select all that apply. A nurse is teaching about healthy nutrition to a senior center. What points should be included for older adults? Select all that apply. Awesome. So for these patients, multivitamins are great. Um, remember, older adults require less um, energy requirements. Um, so we probably don't need to increase their carbs because um, that can kind of lead to weight gain, etc. Um, avoiding grapefruit juice is really important because it's contra contraindicated in most every medication. What diet choice is best for a patient with dumping syndrome? Awesome, so remember dumping syndrome that occurs when food, especially high sugar food, moves way too fast to the GI tract. The reason we want low carb is because of the sugar, but we want low fluid because fluid helps promote motility. It helps promote the food from going faster through the GI tract. So with these patients, we really want low carb, low fluid.
A nurse is providing dietary teaching to a patient who has COPD. Which of the following instructions should the nurse include in teaching? All right, so our patients with COPD, they really struggle with breathing. Um, so any foods that are soft and easy to swallow is going to be pretty beneficial um, because they're going to have to frequently catch their breath a lot. Um, specifically with these patients, we want high calorie, high protein as well. A nurse is planning dietary education to a patient with dumping syndrome post gastrectomy. What intervention should be included? Awesome, low sugar, low fiber diet. They also had a gastrectomy. So where that kind of low fiber part comes in um, is going to be more that gastrectomy, dumping syndrome, think diarrhea. Whenever we have diarrhea, we want low fiber as well. A nurse is um, teaching dietary considerations to a patient with a family history of cardiovascular disease. Um, which of the following statements should the nurse include? So my patient has a family history of cardiovascular disease. What should I teach them? All right, so remember cardiovascular disease, um, that is our heart health. So fiber is very important in heart, felt, heart health. ATI likes to kind of trick you guys with these questions because they have a family history of cardiovascular disease. Do I know if my patient has hypertension? Do I know what's going on? Well, no, I don't. Our DASH diet, that's for hypertension. So whenever we're just trying to promote heart health, increasing fiber is very important. Um, so that's kind of what ATI really likes to do is it likes to kind of add these tricky questions, but do we have a lot of information? No. So our response has to be pretty general. We know that increased fiber has a decreased um, incidence of cardiovascular disease. All right. A nurse is caring for a patient with Parkinson's. Which of the following findings is of immediate concern? All right, so again, immediate concern. Think airway breathing circulation. If my Parkinson's patient is drooling, they are at risk for aspiration. All the rest are pretty normal findings. Shuffling gait is normal. Difficulty with fine motor skills is normal. A weight loss of three pounds in the past month. Again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Three pounds is not a lot of weight, especially in a month. So that's kind of an unrelated thing as well. All right, last question. A nurse is caring for a patient from the Middle East with celiac disease. What should the nurse do in regards to their diet? Awesome. We assess their dietary preferences. Very good job, guys.
Awesome job. Congratulations, everyone. Very good.